Not many will deny the first two games in the Metroid Prime series as masterpieces, and absolutely no one will deny that the Wii console practically printed money in the late 2000s. Nintendo was aware that everyone had one in their living room at the time, from the hardcore to the casuals to the grandmas who heard that that Wii thing was good for keeping the blood going. So it was a no-brainer to develop a second Metroid Prime sequel for the little console that could, did, and wouldn't stop even when we wanted it to. The combination of Metroid Prime's first person shooting and the Wii's motion controls seemed like a match made in space heaven. But Waggletech wasn't nearly the only change that was made to the Prime formula. It was designed to be bigger, meaner, and far more ambitious than its predecessors, literally taking the franchise to places it had never been. And while it's gone on to be just as revered as the first two, it's still worth examining what it's like to complete Metroid Prime 3 Corruption. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of The Completionist. As you guys may or may not know, every February we do a themed month, and this year's theme is Month of Threequels. That's right, we are doing the third entry in a franchise, or just the third game to come from a entry in a series. So I thought, you know what? What better place to start than with the good one, Metroid Prime 3 Corruption. Let's begin. Yes! start, Metroid Prime 3 was planned to set itself apart from what came before. Developers, Retro Studios, were well aware that this is going to be their swan song, so they planned to go all out with a bang, which translated into an increased production value and drastic changes to the current Metroid Prime model. We're talking an unprecedented amount of detail in environments and characters. The increased RAM offered by the Wii allowed for higher quality audio samples, larger environments, 60 frames per second, full voice acting, except for Samus, she still doesn't say much. And of course, there was the Wii motion controller. Instead of using a control stick to move the cursor around the screen, now players just had to point at whatever they wanted to die. It kind of made perfect sense, with the Prime series' lock-on feature always ensuring that players' aims never had to be too good. But all these upgrades spelled delay after delay for Metroid Prime 3. I guess that's understandable, since a delayed game can eventually be good, etc, etc. And according to the reviews, Prime 3 did end up being pretty damn good. Even with all of its efforts to shake things up, it seemed to earn its place alongside the rest of the series. And now that Metroid Prime 4 has been announced, and we got that remake of Samus Returns last year, it's a great time to re-examine this period in Metroid history from a completionist's perspective. Thankfully, Nintendo had the wisdom to throw all three games together into a trilogy pack for the Wii, which eventually came to the Wii U's virtual console, making them nice and easy to access. Completing Metroid Prime 3 will undoubtedly require the familiar amount of patience and smarts to get past its puzzles, and an anal retentive meticulousness in order to scan every last item in the game. We're also looking at having to collect hundreds of power-ups across the campaign in order to transform Samus into the badass that she's destined to be, and then destined to cease being in the first chapter of the next game. And apparently, Prime 3 has a hard mode known as Hyper Mode that's only available after the game is beaten, so that means at least two playthroughs in order to complete this beast, not to mention any further playthroughs in order to earn a peek at any alternate endings that there may be. And the Metroid franchise loves itself some barely different blink and you'll miss it alternate endings. I'm pretty sure one of the games had a bonus ending where the only difference was that Samus had a new hat. But she's got a new hat. <laughs> Allow me to preface this entire section by declaring that this game is fantastic. It's still as sleek and sci-fi as ever, with a much bigger scale to the narrative and scope to the game's world. It's incredibly cool to see Samus in this epic of an adventure, but, and I mean this in the best and most loving way, it doesn't work as well as the more intimate experiences offered by the first two Metroid Primes. 
Metroid Prime 3's plot is a summer blockbuster compared to the last two games. Things kick off with Samus being summoned to a Galactic Federation vessel in order to aid them in their ongoing war against those greedy-ass space pirates. But she's not the only bounty hunter that's been called to action. Three other mercs are muscling on Samus' territory. There's a mild-mannered cyborg with the ability to meld his robo-body with the badass mech suit, a sprite-like metamorph with an attitude problem, and a... Is that an alien version of Iceman? Yo, sick! Just as the big meeting starts, the space pirates attack the Federation vessel, as well as the nearby planet of Norian, with a giant seed pod that threatens to corrupt everything with deadly Phazon. The entire bounty hunter crew is dispatched like a team of X-Men to help out the planet's surface. They succeed in repelling the pirates' assault, but they eventually encounter none other than Dark Samus, Samus' Phazon-powered doppelbaddy. After being hit with Dark Samus' Phazon Mehameha, the hunters are all knocked the f*** out. Fast forward an entire month and Samus awakens in a Federation medbay. She's informed that she's been corrupted by Phazon and that her body is now producing the stuff. Thankfully, the Federation scientists have outfitted her with the Phazon Enhancement Device Suit, which weaponizes her condition into a power-up called Hyper Mode. The bad news is that her fellow hunters were also corrupted by the Phazon Blast and that they've each gone missing. Now, Samus has got a lot on her plate. She's got to find the other hunters, stop the space pirate's plot, defeat Dark Samus, and keep the Phazon corruption from spreading throughout the galaxy and her own body. All of this adds up to one of the most badass, intricate plots that a Metroid game has ever had. But you need more than a good premise to have a good story. And while this more ambitious story is plenty exciting, it has contentious ramifications on the rest of the game. For example, this is by far the most populated Prime yet. Whereas previous entries were more isolated and creepy feeling, with Samus being basically all alone for the entire adventure, in this game, her communicator never stops blowing up. You've got AI systems chiming in constantly, GF troopers to chit-chat with, not to mention your interactions with your fellow X-Men, the Hunters. It's a very different vibe than what's come before, and there are some pros and cons. Some of these new ideas and characters are fascinating, and I'd love to see more of them, but not at the cost of the engrossing atmosphere from the previous games. It wasn't until that atmosphere was removed that its importance became so apparent. In short, Samus works better alone. Things feel a lot more cinematic this time around, with little cutscenes popping up every now and then. They've always been a part of the franchise, but now there's almost always another little snippet just around the corner. They're fine for the most part, but their frequency hurts the immersion that the game worked so hard to achieve in the first place. Almost every cutscene would probably worked better if it had been told through Samus' first person view. The various worlds that Samus visits in Prime 3 are more visually impressive than ever when it comes to their graphical fidelity. Everything looks cool and alien, but this time around, there's a significant lack of strong themes. In previous games, when you entered a new area, you knew it. Transitioning from the Magmore Caverns to the Fendrana Drifts for the first time was jarring as hell, and that was no mistake. But in this game, every location on every world feels dry, bleak, and colorless. That stuff is okay and all, but you've got to have something to balance it against. Almost everything in this game is the same shade of dirty brown or gray. Players waiting to enter a section of this game with some color in it will be waiting a long time. It's hard to thematically identify most areas in Metroid Prime 3, which is only compounded by the far more segmented level design. The main player areas are now separated across several planets, and even on those planets, you'll sometimes have areas that are only reachable by climbing back in Samus' ship and traveling there. Being able to travel from one end of the giant play world to the other on foot is yet another thing Thing I didn't know I'd miss. Even the very best, most pure and good feature of the Prime franchise has been altered. The music. In Prime 3, the tracks stick to a more atmospheric and amelodic sound. There's a serious lack of that sci-fi infused funk that I've come to adore about the series. The music here is fine, but it once again lacks that sense of identity that previous soundtracks had. There's no way to hum the songs in this game, whereas I'll still listen to the first two soundtracks to this day. I'm sorry to say that this game's OST has no place on my playlist, and that really hurts to say. What happened, Kenji? I can't stress enough that, in a vacuum, Metroid Prime 3's presentation is stellar. 
far better than most games. But it's clear that the developers' experiments have produced some diminished results here and there when compared to the previous entries in the trilogy. It's got a better story that's told in a worse way, the music's audio quality is better, but it's not something I'd want to listen to, and the worlds may be more detailed than ever, but they're not nearly as interesting. It's like some kind of weird monkey's paw situation with this game. When are people gonna learn that you can't just make wishes and expect them to turn out the way you'd want? Someone's gotta pay the price. Someone's gotta bleed. Something will go wrong. You can wish for a burger. You can't mess up a burger. What? It's physically impossible. No, it's not. Metroid Prime 3 runs players through the same glorious rat maze that every other Metroid has employed since the dawn of time. Except this time, it's all done by pointing that Wiimote right at the TV. Even beyond the motion controls, there are plenty of other changes to the Prime blueprint that end up making this entry stand out from the pack. And while Metroid Prime 3's gameplay is undoubtedly brilliant, it brings some of its own inherent roadblocks on the road to completion. As always, players' main goal is to shoot bad guys so they can track down power-ups which unlock new paths, inside of which are more bad guys which guard other power-ups which allow access to other paths etc 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 it's a wonderful cycle that stood the test of time but love it or hate it that waggle tech makes certain aspects of that cycle feel very different than how one might remember make no mistake the motion controls are surprisingly responsive and fluid in this title there's really none of that stereotypical imprecision and frustration the motion controls basically work just as intended no matter how one chooses to play if you want to go all in on the motion controls and just play with the free aim you can do that if you feel like relying on the tried and true lock-on feature, there's that too. And if you just want to lock your field of view, leaving you free to aim at your leisure, then that's all gravy. But the most impressive thing about Metroid Prime 3's implementation of motion controls is how it includes several different enemies and encounter types that briefly force players into these different control schemes. For example, you're simply unable to lock on to these swarm bots, requiring you to manually aim. And this boss won't go down unless you manually shoot their projectiles back at them. On the other hand, there are some enemies that are just way easier to deal with by locking onto them. Don't waste your time trying to any Oakley these flying bugs. Trust me, ain't no shame in the lock-on. But of course, not everything involving the Wiimote is fun. Like this series of doors that require you to pull, push, twist, or bop it to open them. I get the idea behind this, but it's never fun and always slows things down. And when it comes to motion controls, you've got to take the good with the bad. But thankfully, in Prime 3, it's mostly the good. Actually, I take that back. In Prime 3, it's mostly scanning. Once again, you will be scanning everything. At least you'll be if you want to completely fill out the in-game logbook. Entering a new room feels like becoming Johnny Five. You become obsessed with absorbing any and all new input. It's better to be safe than sorry. The last thing you want to do is accidentally miss that super rare one-of-a-kind scannable item that you'll never get a chance to scan again, ruining any chance of truly completing the game. Which is exactly what happened to me a couple of times. Thankfully, your logbook progress carries over to the subsequent playthroughs, but imagine if it didn't. Look, it's honestly fascinating to learn more and more about every element around you, but I just wish the color coding for the scanning system was a bit more organized and that there weren't any such things as missables. The other visors, which you're going to be spending far less time with, are the X-ray visor, which makes its return from the first Metroid Prime, and the command visor, which is Samus's way of interacting with her ship. This big boy's expanded role now includes blowing stuff up and carrying big-ass bombs to blow stuff up. Something that's really interesting is the change in how Samus's weapon system works. You still unlock different blasters over the course of the game, but you can't swap between them anymore. Now, when your basic blaster gets upgraded to the plasma cannon, there's no going back. Every weapon upgrade leaves you with all the functionality of the previous weapons, but it's a shame that players can't choose for themselves. Being able to switch between shocking dudes to death and freezing them at will was dope. In Prime 3, there's definitely a sense of progression, and you gradually feel more powerful, but there's not nearly as much room for self-expression. Not to say that the combat isn't great, because it still seriously kicks all kinds of ass. There are tons of ways to dispatch your foes in style. 
There's just something so special about freezing dudes with an ice missile and then shattering them with a charge shot. Mm -mm, that does a body good. Each world offers tons of unique things to kill, including some well-designed and challenging bosses that put your creativity to the test. Even with all the changes to this game's systems, the core combat in Metroid Prime is more solid than it's ever been. And that's due in part to the addition of Samus's Hyper Mode, a powered-up state that you can enter at will. It basically turns Samus into a walking death laser, but at the cost of draining her health as you fight. Thankfully, most targets that must be dealt with in hyper mode will usually drop some health upon defeat. There's a beautiful risk-reward system going on here with hyper mode. It truly makes you feel unstoppable, and it's especially useful for those pesky enemies that were seemingly born with 9 million hit points. But while you use it, you run the risk of depleting your health faster than you realize. Not to mention that when you stay in hyper mode for too long, you'll eventually become corrupted, forcing you to quickly discharge all of the phase on energy before it's lights out for Samus. But that hyper mode is not to be confused with the hyper mode difficulty setting that's unlocked after the first playthrough. It's your general super hard mode with enemies having increased health and damage. Plus, the enemies in the game who are capable of entering hyper mode, just like Samus, are pretty much guaranteed to do so the moment they see you. Meaning that you'll be in hyper mode way more in this mode. Sure, you'll do more damage, but you are running the risk of getting killed way more. It sounds stressful, but after the relatively easy difficulty of normal mode, I was ready and willing for more of a challenge. And for an excuse to erase more fools from existence with my hyper beam. But just when I thought I was safe from the scourge of collectibles, Metroid Prime 3 revealed the credits. Nope, not the end game credits. They're little markers you get as you accomplish certain in-game tasks. Most of the time, they're pretty simple. You'll get a red credit each time you scan a new creature, you'll get a blue one every time you scan in a new lore entry, and you'll get a gold credit for accomplishing significant tasks, like progressing through the campaign and defeating bosses. But then there are the green credits, which are actually obtainable by doing the kind of stuff that's usually tied to achievements. You're gonna have to go out of your way for these things, and some of these require some time, skill, and dumb luck. But that's not even the issue here. There are some green credits that you can only get by having a friend send them to you via the Nintendo Wi-Fi service, which was shut down permanently a few years ago. Which means that there's no way to get every green credit, which really takes the wind out of my completionist sails. Guys, there is seriously no way to complete this game outside of hacking or downloading a save file, neither of which is in the spirit of what we do here on the show. It's so incredibly disappointing that this game ties some of its completion criteria to online play, which is now gone forever. Yet another game which is incompletable. I was honestly so disappointed by this that I just stopped going for any and all green credits altogether. I mean, what's the f***ing point? I'll never be able to get them all, so I might as well focus on the things I can do to complete the game, which is everything else. And it's all because of the developer's insistence on integrating online functionality. If it ain't broke, don't fix it! This is what I've been worried about. This right here is the danger of online achievements and integrations. Do you see where this will inevitably lead us to? Online stuff will be the end of all completionists! Mark my words, people! The end is nigh! Sorry, who put this soapbox underneath me? Game's over, which means it's time for some alternate endings to be drip-fed to us. Real talk, the endings are actually pretty different and revealing this time around. Like, if you beat the game after having collected between 75 and 99% of all the power-ups in the game, you'll unlock a scene in which Samus takes a well-deserved breather and mourns the passing of some of her comrades. Kind of deep. And if you collect every single power-up, you'll earn yourself a bonus sting in which Samus is followed into the depths of space by a mysterious ship that's totally setting up things for Metroid Prime 4. It's cool to be rewarded for all of your efforts with some genuinely interesting developments, rather than just getting a sneak peek at Samus and her Zero Suit. But that's in here too. And then there's the Extras menu, which is the real reason behind collecting all of the credits throughout your playthroughs. It actually includes some neat stuff, like concept art, music, and even a screenshot tool that you can use whenever you want. 
But almost everything costs green credits or some other type of credit that you can only get by playing the other two Metroid Prime games included in the Metroid Prime trilogy. Wonderful. So now, even though I've put in tons of hours into Metroid Prime 3, I'll barely be able to reap any of the rewards. No, nope, I've got to play more games, and even if I did, I can't get any more green credits because the internet won't work. There's simply no way to unlock everything here without completing entirely different games and without a goddamn time machine. Once I learned about the green credit fiasco, I knew I was never gonna be able to complete this title. But seeing your potential reward so close and yet so far really just rubs the salt in the wounds. It's such a shame that the way that this game was implemented into the trilogy has left such a bad taste in my mouth. Because when you look at the game outside of its unlockables, it's absolutely wonderful. But whereas the previous Primes were undoubtedly worth completing, Metroid Prime 3 makes you hesitate quite a bit. While I completed Metroid Prime 3 Corruption, there were 4 deaths, 3 campaign playthroughs, 212 credits earned, 21 hours of total playtime, and too much time spent on the grill drying out the meat entirely. And that's how you mess up a burger, Brett. Ah, uh, okay, touche. When it comes to its gameplay, Metroid Prime 3 stands toe to toe with the rest of the Metroid Prime franchise. But a few missteps in aesthetics and bonuses keep it from being truly perfect. Thanks to certain limitations, it may not be worth completing, but it's still more than worthy of the Metroid Prime name. Metroid Prime 3 Corruption is one of those games that, while it makes massive strides pushing the franchise forward with great gameplay, graphics, and a better narrative, it takes massive leaps backwards, doing backflips almost, with the fact that it forgot where it came from. And most importantly, if you are a completionist, you're going to hate yourself in knowing that you cannot complete this game in 2018 due to disconnected netcode services. So. With that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of finish it. Finish it. That's all time we have for today, guys. So please, as always, let me know about today's episode somewhere on the internet. If you like today's episode, do me a favor, leave a like, leave a comment down below what you want to see upcoming in the month of threequels. And hey, if you missed last week's video, you can give it a click or tap right here. I'll see you guys next week for another brand new episode of The Completionist New Game Plus Hype. Let's do this. I'll see you guys. Bye.